Right, and now we will move on to another common surgical emergency, treatment of the GI bleeding in the bariatric patient by Dr. Dean McCamey from The Ohio State University. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Uh, Sherman and Dr. Shermer. If we have my slides up, please. So I'll be talking about uh, control of uh, GI bleeding in the bariatric patient population here. Uh, here are my disclosures. Uh, none of these uh, conflicts will have any uh, bearing on this talk. So when we talk about incidence of post-operative hemorrhage in the bariatric uh, patient population, in the room wide gastric bypass, about 1 to 3%. Um, adjustable gastric banding, very low, uh, under 1%. And probably the sleeve gastrectomy, uh, approximately 1%. So some of the risk factors, uh, we're using more and more uh, prophylactic um, anticoagulation, uh, probably increased use of surgical staples, and the learning curve associated with the uh, uh, different operations, such as the sleep gastrectomy. Uh, when you look at anticoagulation, um, there was a study done by, uh, a very good study done by SPA, looking at 3,000 patients undergoing uh, gastric bypass surgery. Nobody in this 3,000 patient group died from bleeding but there was uh, up to one in 500 that may get a fatal um, um, clot. So some of the uh, other th risk factors, surgical staple lines, when you look at a ruin wide gastric bypass, uh, it could be 60 to 70 centimeters of staple line. When you're talking about a sleeve gastrectomy, uh, between 25 and 40 centimeters of staple line. Some studies have shown that the learning curve for a ruin wide gastric bypass may be between uh, 50 to 75 cases. Uh, inexperienced surgeons may use inappropriate sized uh, staple loads. Acute bleeding uh, is usually uh, when you have extra luminal bleeding, the acute bleeding uh, is usually extra luminal. So in a ruin white gastric bypass, a sleeve gastrectomy, or even an adjustable uh, gastric band, uh, it's usually from the site of transection of the stomach. It could be from small uh, intestinal uh, mesentery, a splenic injury in all th three of these operations is a possibility and bleeding at one of the trocar sites. So if you're on call and you have a patient that came in, you don't know what operation the patient had. From all these three things, these are the first uh, four things you should look for. Um, in the gastric bypass, uh, intraluminal bleeding can be seen at four major places, the gastrojejunostomy, the um, gastric pouch, the jejunostomy, or the staple line of the uh, gastric remnant. In the sleeve gastrectomy, pretty simple. Look for the staple line of the sleeve. And if you find intraluminal uh, bleeding in an adjustable gastric band, there's probably a esophageal or a gastric perforation. Um, you know, for prevention, uh, we should probably choose the appropriate size staples. Maybe think of over sewing the uh, uh, staple lines, performing hand sewn um, anastomosis. Uh, application, when you fire stapler, wait the uh, allotted time using uh, possible staple line reinforcements, use hemostatic agents on the staple line. When you talk about staple line height, there was a uh, study that uh, I was involved with, a randomized prospective study looking at a 3.5 EEA stapler versus a 4.8 in uh, about 180 patients in each group. Uh, there was a trend towards a leader, uh, lower bleeding rate in the uh, 3.5 uh, millimeter staple. Uh, other staple line reinforcements have been out there, uh, peristrip, uh, peristrip dry, seam guard, and um, Covidian's um, duet. There was a st uh, study by Scotch Cora looking at bovine pericardium in 250 patients uh, versus 100 patients prior without any um, uh, bovine pericardium, and there was no uh, visual bleeding with the bovine pericardium in his study. Another study by uh, Dr. Wynn looking at the 17 patients in each group randomized to um, glycolide, copolymer, or seam guard, and 17 control groups. Um, in the glycolide, copolymer group, there was a tendency towards uh, lower bleeding. Also, another study by uh, Miller looking at the same thing in 24 patients in each group. Uh, in the post op, um, the number of surgical clips that were used in each group. Uh, was significantly lower with the uh, glycolide copolymer group versus uh, no um, staple line treatment. Uh, just a quick uh, note on fibrin sealants. Uh, in a study by uh, 340 patients uh, from 2004 to 2005 undergoing uh, gastric bypass, when fibrin sealing was used, there was no bleeds in the fibrin sealing group versus two in the control group, but it was uh, non not significant. 
So when you see a patient in the ER, the first thing you want to do is you want to diagnose this patient as quick as possible. You use your vital signs, uh, uh, tachycardia, hypotension, of course, urine output less than 30 cc's an hour if they have a Foley catheter and uh, uh, decreased Metacrit. Um, diagnosis also may help in the acute setting. Maybe um, uh, a patient had an operation done and the surgeon went out of town. They left a drain in. That may help you to um, determine if you have extraluminal versus intraluminal bleed. Um, if you have emesis of bright red blood, it well, probably is an intraluminal bleed. The gastric pouch could be the site. Uh, melana, probably a remnant stomach bleed or bleed from the JJ. Or if you see a large bruise on the abdominal wall, uh, don't be uh, fooled by trocars because trocars can lead to a lot of intro fat bleeding. I mean, the patients can lose uh, liters of blood in their intro fat uh, area. Uh, the gastric remnant bleed is a very hard bleed to uh, identify. You know, patients uh, may be in the hospital or have been discharged. If they come back in um, and they have left upper quadrant pain, maybe back pain or severe nausea and vomiting without throwing anything up, you could have a remnant stomach bleed. And these bleeds, if not diagnosed, can um, be very serious. So when you try to diagnose this, you know, you're called for a patient. Unfortunately, the odds are kind of split. In a gastric bypass patient, 21% can happen in the gastric agenostomy, 21% can happen in the pouch, not so much in the excluded stomach, or the, uh, and it also can happen at the uh, jeju jejunostomy. So management, once again, uh, fluid resuscitation, uh, stop all the uh, anticoagulation products, get your stat labs, and number one thing, get good IV access. Um, in, the, in this review study, once again, by SPA, looking at the management of post-op hemorrhage in 2,895 uh, patients, 89 patients or 3.1% of patients had a clinically significant uh, post-op hemorrhage, 20% uh, required an operation. So the good news is 80% did not require an operation. So they can be managed with observation, resusci uh, resuscitation with fluid or blood, and uh, endoscopy. In the non-operative management uh, in this group, 20% were observed alone without any uh, further treatment. 55% of patients received a blood transfusion, and 15% of patients underwent uh, endoscopy to try to localize the, the, uh, the site of bleed. For endoscopy, uh, I think the key thing is um, if you do endoscopy yourself or if you have a GI colleague, you got to do these endoscopies in the OR. You want to intubate the patient protect the patient's airway, and do it under a safe, controlled environment. Number one, you have an anesthesiologist with you. You're doing your endoscopy. You're, if you're doing it down in endoscopy suite and you push your drugs and the patient's pressure drop, then you're all by yourself with the nurse. So if you're in the OR, I mean, you can open up as, as quick as you want um, um, in the OR. So I recommend always, if somebody comes back with a post-op hemorrhage, we take them straight to the OR intubate the patient, and then in a controlled setting, we'll go down with our endoscope. And I recommend not using a, a standard 9.0 uh, nine, uh, nine uh, millimeter endoscope, but using a 12 millimeter therapeutic endoscope with a 4.8 millimeter uh, channel so you can suction out large clots. And if possible, use uh, CO2 uh, endoscopic inflation, uh, insufflation uh, to reduce the amount of gas bloat that these patients see after. Um, so one option is if you go in there, you suction the blood out of the stomach or the blood out of the sleeve, you can inject with epinephrine 1 in 10,000, you can do surgical clipping, or you can do a combination. You know, I think the key here is you need to have a team approach. Um, at my hospital, uh, I do a lot of endoscopy. If a patient comes back, we'll bring them to the OR, or if they come, back, if they come down from the floor, I'll put a scope down. My partners will be at the table scrubbed in. They'll get... Um, intra-abdominal axis, and as I put the scope down, I can tell them the bleeding is on the staple line, the bleeding's at the uh, gastric jejunostomy, or I don't see any blood in the stomach. At that point, they can look for uh, the source of bleeding at the JJ, at the remnant, at the spleen, at the trochlear sites. So you really want to uh, do a combination type um, operation if possible. There was a study by uh, Fernandez looking at endoscopy and post-gastric bypass patients with bleeds. Uh, looking to see if injections were possible. He did six patients. He found five bleeds that he injected with epinephrine, and one patient, the, um, the post-op bleed already stopped. So there was no complication in the series. 
Um, another good thing, another good tool to do is maybe um, if you have time in the future when FES comes out for Sages, um, practice on these, um, these trainers. You know, the worst time to do something is uh, in the OR for the first time in your life. So, you know, use these trainers and use Sages as a good training uh, tool to help you um, prior to actually seeing one. So I think the key is surgical intervention uh, needs to be done early um, if a patient is unstable. So if you have a patient and you know, you know what, I think I'm going to do endoscopy first. But they look at the vitals, they're tachycardic, they're hypotensive, you know, that may not be the best thing. Just take them to the OR and probably get ready for an operation. If you do go to the uh, OR, uh, I think an initial uh, laparoscopy is a safe thing to do as long as you have uh, a fairly stable patient. Um, when you go in laparoscopically and the bowel is full of blood and you cannot see anything, be prepared to do a laparotomy. You know, at that point, it's going to be so hard to see the gastrojejunostomy, the jeju jejunostomy, the spleen. You really want to go there and kind of treat it like a trauma. Pack everything off and treat um, the abdomen like a trauma. Take the packs out. Okay, I don't see any blood by the spleen. Let's look at the uh, gastrojejunostomy. You know, if you can't see it, it's too enlarged and, or if there's too much uh, fluid or anything, pack it off. Try to over -sew it if possible. Put an endoscope down. With the endoscope, if you see a site of bleeding, you can over -sew the staple line at the uh, gastrojejunostomy and the uh, gastric staple line. Then at that point, you know, if that's okay, look at your uh, remnant uh, stomach. Maybe you have to over -sew that. If the remnant stomach is gigantic and full of blood, one option may be to actually open up the remnant stomach, uh, look inside there, evacuate the clot, and put a G-tube in there, because the prob patient's probably going to need some um, uh, feeding for a little while after. Uh, consider draining the gastrojejunostomy, the jejunostomy, or the sleeve gastrectomy, because uh, unfortunately, if there is a lot of blood in the lumen of the stomach or the small bowel, there is a pretty good chance that there's a much higher chance that you may get a leak after. So having the drains in there will uh, tell you early on if there's a leak or if there's ongoing bleeding. Um, if bleeding is not found around the staple lines, once again, explore around that angle of hiss. In all three operations, the sleeve, the adjustable gastric band, and the rheumatoid gastric bypass, you could have a missed splenic injury that would bleed for, for a long time. So once again, that's the, a key point to look at. Don't overlook the spleen. If you've got to take the spleen out, you can't control it, you've got to take the spleen out. And at that, at that point, you can use your hemostatic agents, you can put your fibrin products in um, to try to control the bleed as much as possible there. So in conclusion, uh, bleeding after um, barracks surgery is uncommon. Fortunately, most patients will not require an operation. Uh, but when you do need to operate, uh, be prepared. Uh, use a, a methodical approach with endoscopy, laparoscopy, and lastly, uh, laparotomy if needed. Thank you very much. Very good. Thank you very much, Dr. McCullough.